Coming up, an official from FEMA discusses extreme weather events affecting tribal nations. An advocate on Buffalo shares more on the farm bill, and Nick Tilson gives us an update on Leonard Peltier. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We start today in Hawaii, where a complicated debate about fire, water, and colonialism has added to growing tensions following a deadly wildfire in Lahaina. A land developer in Maui has asked state officials to divert water from rural streams to fight the growing fire. This request was complicated by history dating back to the mid-1800s when the water rights of Native Hawaiians were stolen in order to build plantations. Community members, including Native Hawaiian farmers, say the water the developer wanted for its reservoirs would not have made a difference in the fires. The reservoirs don't supply Maui County's fire hydrants and firefighting helicopters, which could have dipped into the reservoirs for water. They were grounded by high winds. Native Hawaiians have long fought to protect what they consider a sacred resource, and stream diversions continued long after the plantations were closed. Much of that plantation land has become multi-million dollar gated homes that now use the diverted water. At one time, Lahaina was known to be very verdant and very lush, said Blossom Faitiera, a Native Hawaiian cultural practitioner and Lahaina native. She said Hawaiians revere water so much and its abundance, which is why Lahaina became the capital of the Hawaiian kingdom from 1820 to 1845. Another dimly lit corner of Indian boarding school history is posed for some daylight. That's because records from Quaker-run schools are set to be digitized and released to the public. Documents related to Quaker-operated Indian boarding schools have been largely unstudied as they sit in remote and dispersed collections. Now the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, or NABS, will make 20,000 archival pages available on a public database. The records range from 1852 to 1945. They cover at least nine schools in Indiana, Kansas, Nebraska, New York, Ohio, Oklahoma, and Pennsylvania. The records will be posted in 2024 on the National Indian Boarding School Digital Archive database, which NABS will launch later this year. Well, AMC's hit show Dark Winds is gearing up for its season two finale. The series is a psychological crime set in the 1970s in a remote town on the Navajo Nation. It follows a series of murders and robberies. Among the actors, it features hunk papa Lakota lead Zon McLaren and Hualapai citizen Kyle Gordon. Fans may recognize parts of the show as Dark Winds is filmed in New Mexico around Santa Fe and at Camel Rock Studios, which is the former casino hall of Tezuki Pueblo. Several of the episodes this season have been directed by Native people, including Episode 5 with Navajo creative Billy Luther. Cheyenne and Arapaho producer Chris Eyre directed this season's finale. It premieres on Sunday, September 3rd at 9 p.m. Eastern. If you can't wait that long, it'll be available on Thursday, August 31st on AMC+. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. The price tag is expected to exceed $1.5 trillion as tribes increase buffalo herds as cultural and economic development strategies. Troy Heinert is watching. 
He is the executive director of the Intertribal Buffalo Council and spoke to ICT Shirley Snavy recently. Take a look. We've spent a lot of time uh, talking with congressional representatives about the Farm Bill and, and the needs in Indian country uh, to be included in the Farm Bill. You know, it's a, it's a monster bill uh, in the trillions of dollars. And, you know, we want to make sure that that tribes and native producers are well represented uh, in the Farm Bill. Your concern is bison. Your organization's uh, concern is the Intertribal uh, Buffalo Association. You must have some particular needs and uh, some priorities for what you'd like to see included in that. Within the Farm Bill, that that controls processing and uh, you know access to other programs. And oftentimes, you know, tribes are either left out and, and buffalo especially. Uh, or they're kind of an afterthought. And uh, if a rule is made or or something is in the farm bill that that affects uh, tribal buffalo programs, you know, we need to make sure that uh, whatever is in the farm bill is is conducive to, to what tribes are trying to do and how they manage buffalo. Uh, but for example, you know, one thing that we've really worked on is uh, processing abilities uh, getting getting more processing uh, for buffalo. Uh, you know, buffalo are a, a large animal. Not every place wants to to handle buffalo, and so you know, tribes are really limited in in where they can process their animals. So we've been working on different avenues uh, for that. Going back to those old days uh, where we used every single part of the buffalo, you know, whether it was clothes or tools or supplies, are are you seeing that kind of uh, uh, things still happening with tribes today? Oh yeah, we've we've seen a large re resurgence of, of that, and uh, you know we've we've been going out. We uh, uh, built a, a we call it the cultural harvest trailer, um, in, in partnership with the USDA, and we've been going around and doing cultural harvests at, at different sites, uh, and then in the meantime, we're writing a curriculum. Uh, to go with it about some safe handling and and it's worked very very well uh, and we are seeing you know the the benefits uh, from that program. Has it made a difference over the past couple of years to have people like Heather Dunn Thompson and uh, Janie Hip and uh, Zach Ducheneau in high level positions in the USDA? You know we we've never had access to. Uh, to those you know high level positions within the USDA before and so having you know tribal members that are uh, familiar with our territory and understand you know uh, indigenous life ways uh, it, it's been super beneficial uh, to all our tribes so you know we're very thankful we work very close with them we work a lot with the uh, intertribal ag council you know other indigenous groups um, we want to make sure that we're you know that we support their efforts and, and they're supporting ours uh you know we're uh we can't we can't be competing against each other we're, we're already a, a minority anyway um so we want to just make sure that that we're sending you know a good strong message of of you know what the needs are in indian country and making sure that uh people first off get educated about us and and second you know the ones who are the decision makers uh, make informed decisions and uh, to help, you know, get get more resources or, uh, you know, rule changes that that benefit Indian country. Uh, well, right now, you know, they're they're marking it up. So, you know, as we hear of of hearings or or things that are going to be included or excluded uh, from the farm bill, then you know we have to get on the phone and and make sure that uh, you know we're represented. Uh, and that they know, you know, what we're we would like to see included in the farm bill. Um, obviously, with a with a split uh, Congress, um, you know, some the the House wants certain things in it, the Senate wants certain things in it, and at, at some point they're going to have to, you know, come to a compromise. But you know, it's a it's a monster bill, and it affects everything from food stamps to, uh, I mean, you name it, and. You know, it's it's really important. I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know if it's going to pass this year. I, I think it it has a better shot of coming out of the Senate than it does the House. Um, but you know, we'll wait and see. You're going to see ITBC out and about more. 
um, you know, we're going to start our, our surplus program here uh, actually in next week, or uh, I think our first one is is September 9th. Um, so, you know, we're going to start moving Buffalo around the country and, um, you know, it's very exciting time for tribes. How does that work? Surplus Buffalo, who has the surplus Buffalo? So we receive Buffalo from uh, surplus Buffalo from national parks and grasslands. Uh, we also have an agreement with the Nature Conservancy. And so, you know, Buffalo that, that uh, they can't uh, house anymore. Uh, we redistribute those to tribes all over. Troy Heinert of the Intertribal Buffalo Council. 2,000 bison will be redistributed to tribes across the country. In Lincoln, Nebraska, Shirley Snavy, ICT News. Leonard Peltier has been in federal prison for nearly 49 years, and many groups, including the Indian Collective, are pushing the White House for his release. ICT's Mark Trahant talks to the organization's president and CEO, Nick Tilson, about the latest effort. Nick, welcome. There have been several attempts to have Leonard Peltier's prison term uh, reduced. Uh, what's the situation now? So yeah, we're here, you know, Leonard Peltier has been incarcerated for 48 years, going on 49. Um, you know, he's the longest living uh, indigenous political prisoner in the history of the United States. And so, um, yeah, we're in, we're in the time of an administration, um, in the Biden administration that has been a champion for indigenous people's rights and Indian country um, and have made uh, so, uh, indigenous civil rights in this country a priority for this administration, yet we're still here with uh, Leonard Paltier still incarcerated. And so the latest efforts over the past few years have been to uh, press hard and to educate uh, a new generation of people about this case because it's been going on so long. Some people don't know about it. I mean, one of the biggest stories and people understand, have to understand is they have to understand what was happening in that period of history, what was happening at that time. You know, the American Indian movement was started in 1968 on the streets of Minneapolis. And between 1968 and 1976, the American Indian movement and, and, and grassroots indigenous people throughout Indian country, there was, there was an uprising of, uh, of folks reclaiming identity, reclaiming land, reclaiming power, um, you know, took over the BIA headquarters. Um, some of the you know, some of the demands that were that were in there um, are still relevant to this day. But what happened at that time is the United States government decided and made the decision to uh, to attack the American Indian movement, and they engaged in a counterintelligence uh, uh, strategy to um, to try to pacify the the American Indian movement. So at one given time, almost every one of the leaders in the American Indian movement was incarcerated, was in was jailed, was facing charges. Um, the movement became heavily infiltrated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Um, and in in the atmosphere after Wounded Knee in 1973, all the way into the to the shootout in 1975, that period of time was considered the reign of terror on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, which is my home community. Uh, I live in Porcupine um, and about three and a half miles from a wounded knee, uh, where wounded knee, uh, where wounded knee is. And at that time in history, you had um, the goons or the guardians of the Oglala Nation who were heavily funded by the United States government. And the United States has done this in countries all around the world. They did it right here too with his paramilitary forces. And so it was in this climate where there was FBI, US Marshals, paramilitary folks, heavily funded uh, and supported. And, and actually in the days leading up to the shootout at Oglala, they had made all these false um, uh, narratives. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, what, what happened on that day is that they came in there with the intention to take down that camp. And within not only the two agents, but within within minutes, people in that camp are taking gunfire from agents all around. And 
On that day, two agents were killed, um, Kohler and Williams. And there was a third person killed, Joe Stunts, who was Native American, uh, who was a Native American person who um, whose his murder and his killing was never investigated at all. And that tells everything about this, you know. Uh, the UN uh, even recently, you know, came to the conclusion that the only reason why Leonard Paltier is still in prison is because he's Native American. You know, the FBI and every single FBI agent swears an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. But several times throughout this entire proceedings and this entire, uh, you know, criminalization of Leonard Paltier, they have, they, have, they have engaged in constitutional violations and prosecutorial misconduct and fabrication of evidence. So they have created so many false narratives and so many false lies, it's hard for them to go back on. And remember, in the days after the shootout, this became the biggest manhunt in the history of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And it's time for this administration and it's time for folks in the positions of power to release him. In comparison, Nelson Mandela sat in prison for 27 years. He sat in prison for 27 years because of his political beliefs, because of the things he was fighting for to abolish apartheid in South Africa, because of the revolutionary things that he was trying to change. And here you have Leonard Paltier, who's been sitting in there 48 years going on 49 years. And I share that just to put things into comparison of the, the depth of this injustice. Leonard is, you know, Leonard's elderly now. He's, he's, Leonard is an elder. Um, you know, we're coming up uh, on his birthday. His health has been struggling for years. Um, and, um, and he's frustrated. I mean, his, He's frustrated. He's very, very frustrated, but he's holding out to be strong. He he know like he like some of the stuff that he has said is I don't have much time. Like I don't have much time left. What he meant was I don't have much time on this earth left. Um, and he wants to know people are fighting for him. And um, and he gets very frustrated too because he's isolated for, from his people, from his community. And so um, there's a lot of emotions that he has at this at this time mixed with um, the health concerns. I mean, why do you have an elder at Coleman in a maximum security prison? And he, and of course, like he's a fighter though too, like he's a warrior. And so even though his he's struggling, he is struggling. He's still fighting on to 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 make sure that he makes it um, all the way to his to his potential release. Um, and so I think that's where, when we mobilize for Leonard, uh, when we organize for Leonard, when we voice our, uh, uh, when we speak to Trump truth to power, we're being light to this struggle, it, it helps him keep fighting. It helps him to show that people on the outside have not forgotten about him, and it keeps him motivated to keep fighting uh, every single day. From coast to coast, major weather events are happening more often. As we've seen recently, some can be life-threatening, like hurricanes, heat waves, and droughts. All of this means that the Federal Emergency Management Agency has been very busy. Joining us today from FEMA is Kelby Kennedy, who is a National Tribal Affairs Advocate. She is the direct point of contact between the agency and tribal nations. Hello to you, Kelby. Halito, Aliyah. Thanks so much for having me back. We have to start today, of course, in Florida with Hurricane Adalia. There, of course, are two federally recognized tribes there, the Seminole and the Miccosukee, plus, of course, the lots of urban Native people who live in the area. What are you hearing about how those communities fared? 
So uh, the hurricane is actually going through not just Florida, but also the entirety of FEMA Region 4. So we've been in contact with all of the tribal nations within the path of the hurricane, including those in Florida and outside of Florida. What we're hearing so far from tribal nations overall is that there are no major impacts. We haven't received any notifications from tribal nations of major impacts or immediate needs, but we're making sure to keep in contact with tribal nations, emergency management teams and leadership. One thing, um, Aliyah, I wanna highlight in particular, I think it's something that speaks to a common theme across Indian country. The Miccosukee tribe in particular has offered to the state government to help with search and rescue teams, with water rescue teams. And we just see that all across Indian country. Even when tribal nations aren't hit by a disaster, they step up to help their neighbors and also fellow uh, tribal citizens who may be in urban areas as well. We know that on Monday, ahead of the hurricane, President Biden signed a disaster declaration in another state for the Burns Paiute tribe. Um, tell us about those efforts. So the Burns Paiute uh, incident happened back in June. Um, they were having many storms, landslides, mudslides that impacted their tribal facilities. And so the disaster declaration process takes what's a little bit of time and it also takes uh, steps like a preliminary damage assessment. So our FEMA Region 10 team has been working with the tribal nation, making sure to get all the documents in order. And we were really happy to see President Biden issue the major disaster declaration directly for the nations uh, just a few days ago. Let's jump over to uh, Maui, where, of course, the communities there are recovering from the devastating wildfires in Lahaina. What has FEMA been doing to help the Native Hawaiian people there? So just as you said, Aliyah, the wildfires in Maui were absolutely devastating. Um, currently, we're in the recovery phase. We have a Pacific office that is located within Hawaii that was already staffed, but we've sent additional FEMA staff out to Hawaii. We're currently working with all of our sister agencies, including the Department of the Interior. We have an internal task force that was set up in order to help us address cultural issues. We really have to move at the speed of trust. We need to continue working and doing outreach to the Native Hawaiian community and Native Hawaiian organizations. And so we're, again, trying to work in a way that respects uh, the needs of the Native Hawaiian community to help them recover. It's going to take a while, but FEMA is going to be here as long as it takes to help the community. We know that, of course, uh, August was just a really, really uh, busy time for extreme weather. We saw the tropical storm Hillary in Southern California. Um, were you hearing any reports from tribal nations that were impacted, say, by flooding or other effects of the tropical storm? Yes, so the, the impacts of this tropical storm are still being reported by tribal nations. We've had nation that, nations that have reported that the storm has impacted roadways and other infrastructure. Um, our FEMA teams out in FEMA Region 9 are continuing to be in contact with those nations along in conjunction with our sister agencies to make sure that we're capturing the damages that those tribal nations need to report in order to be considered for not just a direct disaster declaration, but other assistance that FEMA can help. As I mentioned before, we know that extreme weather events seem to be happening so much more often, and we know that experts say some of this is linked to climate change. Um, what can tribal leaders do to be proactive uh, ahead of projected storms in the future? So the biggest thing tribal leaders can do today, I would say, is really focus on building emergency management in blue sky days. You know, Every single tribal nation was hit by COVID-19, and all tribal leaders had to you know, suddenly realize if they hadn't already that the worst time to figure out how to go through disaster declarations and emergency management rules and regulations is when a disaster happens. So the more that tribal nations can really support their emergency management internally, hire that emergency manager, build that emergency management department, the better off we'll be. In addition to that, doing trainings and exercises. So for example, we have um, in 2024, we're gonna have our ninth annual tribal nations training week at the Center for Domestic Preparedness. That'll be March 9th through 16th. Um, that's a free opportunity. Any tribal nation that wants to send staff, it doesn't have to be you know, your emergency manager. It can be your communication staff, it can be your grant staff, it can be your healthcare staff to this training. Um, it's a free opportunity and FEMA pays for everything up front. So really wanna stress for tribal nations, again, focus on those blue sky days, um, going through preparedness, and you also get to know your FEMA regional tribal liaisons and FEMA 15. FEMA is built out into 10 regions and we have fantastic tribal staff in each of the regions who will work with your staff to help develop you know, emergency operation plans, mitigation plans, really help your tribal nation in whatever way that you want to build your emergency management capacity, get the resources and the training you need to be effective. So by the time a disaster actually hits, like you mentioned, Aaliyah, 
because of climate change, you're going to have everything ready. And FEMA will make sure that we're living up to that treaty and trust responsibility to all tribal nations. As I mentioned earlier, you are the National Tribal Affairs Advocate at FEMA, which means that you're a political appointee. Do you know if there are any plans uh, post this Biden administration to make this a civil servant position and therefore would make it a little bit more permanent? So the, as you mentioned, Aliyah, the National Tribal Affairs Advocate is a political appointment and super excited to have Administrator Chris Rell focus on creating this position. Tribal leaders have asked for a political appointee position. We do have a career position, a National Tribal Affairs Advisor that has been within FEMA for several years. Uh, we just brought on my colleague, Jay LaPlante, who took on that mantle. But as of right now, if tribal nations want to continue having that elevated level of access to the administrator and a, a larger voice for Indian country, um, you know, be vocal. You know, if, if my role as advocate and not not Kelby Kennedy, but the role of having a political appointee for tribal nations is something that tribes want to have continued in future administrations. Um, we've gotten feedback from some tribes saying they definitely want it codified in the future. Um, and would love to continue hearing feedback from Indian country because, again, having this elevated position, I can tell you from being inside this agency for 11 months, makes all the difference to make sure that the administrator gets, you know, gets the right information immediately about impacts to tribal nations in Indian country. Well, FEMA National Tribal Affairs Advocate Kelby Kennedy, thank you so much for your time today. Yakuke, thank you. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.